there was concerns for her. They scramble a media conference. If I had to pick a daughter, I couldn't pick anybody else. Good afternoon. And I miss her terribly. Firstly, can I thank you all for coming here today? I was frantically looking for bits of evidence when we got there. I mean, we s pockets, diaries, everything really. Really didn't know what to do, and no point in searching because there's so many areas around there. It's very difficult just sitting inside, waiting, 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 and not really knowing what was happening in the background. The police need help too. Who else lives in 44 Canning Road? Chris Jeffries. As landlord, he has the keys to Joe's flat. I came much more into contact with the police um, because I'm also the uh, secretary of the management company for the, for the whole building. Um, and there was a great deal to do in making sure that they had access to all the flats, including the flats uh, where the owners were not there um, at the time. Um, so yes, I was rather preoccupied with their requirements. Christopher Jeffries can have no idea how preoccupied he would become with the police. On the night that Joe had returned to the building, all Mr. Jeffries could say about his whereabouts is that he's alone reading. Downstairs, Joe's parents were now visiting Vincent Tabak's flat. His girlfriend seems keen to help, he less so. She was very kind and she said, yeah. is there anything I can do? Can we I think she said I, I don't know if she said we, but anyway, he definitely took a step back as far as he could get from the doorway. Vincent Tabak was very unusual. He was very organised, very calm and very rational, in that he's not caught up in the horror of the moment as everyone else would be. Vincent Tabak was spoken to for the first time by the police as a result of that call when they came round to take details treating it, as it was at that time, as a missing person inquiry. Tabak was soon almost bragging that he lived in the building which was at the centre of the news. Those who were close to Vincent Tabak, whether it was Tanya, whether it was work colleagues, whether, whether it was friends, there were friends that they met at dinner parties, you know, he convinced those that he had little or no knowledge of Joe, that he knew nothing about a disappearance um, and he portrayed this image as actually he was a bit of a victim himself in that you know he was under stress and and he was concerned and he was doing his utmost to reassure Tanya we know through emails between the two of them that he was trying to reassure her and there was one instance of one dinner party when some of the female guests there were, were concerned about walking home and he walked them home he went back to work on the Monday. He was talking to people about the disappearance of his neighbour. As already arranged, he and Tanya um, travel um, up country to Cambridge uh, to have Christmas with her parents and then travelled across to Holland to have New Year with family and friends out there. Now Vincent de Back had left the Bristol area at the end of the 23rd of December. He was spending Christmas in Cambridgeshire with his girlfriend's family. And then on the 28th of December, he left the UK and traveled to the Netherlands through the Channel Tunnel. In Holland, Christmas celebrations are underway. It's eight days since the call to say that Joe was missing. Police continue the search for missing landscape architect Joanna Yates. The 25-year-old has not been seen since last Friday. Police are treating the case as a missing person's inquiry, but are increasingly concerned with her whereabouts. In fact, we were in a bubble. The whole world was sort of doing things, you know. Christmas well, it was Christmas season. Day, isn't it, you know? It's about quarter to nine, 
on Christmas Day morning, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Birch were walking their dog in Longwood Lane, and there was a, if I describe it as a mound underneath the snow, uh, by by a wall, uh, with a quarry on the other side of the wall, and I think they walked past once, and it was just something that wasn't quite right. And they went back again, and they could see. I think an area of the jeans, Joe's jeans, exposed, and thought is, I think that's a, that's a body of a human. We were talking about when we ever see, you know, we'll be dying without knowing what happened to Joe, and um, then we got the call on, on Christmas Day saying, uh, from the police saying, you know. Those body has been found, etc. It was relief because we we're absolutely certain by this time that Joe was no longer alive. I think I would probably have spent quite a lot of time just looking. I think I would have possibly got a bit obsessive about it. Um, I don't know. I'm glad I wasn't in that position, really. No. The thing, when Joe's body had been found, it clarified a lot of things because Joe hadn't been sexually attacked. Well, it became a murder inquiry from that day yeah. because they knew how she, she hadn't just died. No. They knew she'd been strangled. Yeah. And uh, then, it turned, then the, it turned into a real whodunit for the press um, because it was really was like a, a murder mystery. The hunt was now on for the killer of Joanna Yates. Joanna Yates had been killed at her home in Bristol. Police quickly recognised some key facts. There are no broken windows. No smashed doors. Joe was attacked by somebody that she had let into the premises. There was no sign of forced entry. It was somebody that she either knew or recognised. Chris Jeffries had had a conversation that same afternoon with Greg, and he would have known that she was going to be there on her own that weekend. He uh, was landlord of the premises, and we know he had a spare key. Chris Jeffries is interesting the media. They'd heard he may have changed his original statement to the police. He meets a reporter at the doorstep. He didn't immediately recognise that I was the person he was after, but as soon as he did realise that, um, he rather excitedly walked down the drive with me. Are you able to give us any detail of what I'm, it was you told them? I'm afraid not, no. I'm the only person who had any business asking questions that I might be in a position to answer. Uh, were the police, um, which I made uh, pretty clear to the reporters, probably in a slightly exasperated way. I'm not prepared to make any comments to the media. So you, okay? didn't, you didn't see her that evening? I certainly cannot say that um, I saw Joanna Yates that evening, no. Thank you very much. Christopher Jeffries had not changed his statement. He had added to it. He was trying to be helpful, but had become a person of interest to the police. I believe I had reasonable grounds to arrest Chris Jeffries. So I opened the door um, and was immediately confronted by two detectives who showed their ID, um, who announced, we're arresting you on suspicion of the murder of Joe Yates. Vincent Tabac is online following every detail of the case whilst in Holland. He now offers police remarkable new evidence. One thing he did do was make contact with the police while he was out of the country. And at 10 o'clock that morning, Vincent Tabac and his girlfriend made a telephone call to explain that um, he had remembered that his landlord's motor car had apparently changed direction overnight. He rang up with information stating that on the evening of the 17th of December, the person in custody who had a car parked to the rear of that premises in the communal parking area, 44 Canning Road, 
the car had moved. That was significant for me as a senior investigator. And he knew the relevance of that. The bookish bachelor, Christopher Jeffries, was unaware that Tabak had incriminated him. Mr. Jeffries was now in custody being interrogated. I was invited um, to admit that on the particular Friday evening on which uh, jo was thought to have disappeared. I had gone round to her flat. I had let myself in because as a landlord I had a key and that um, everything had then um, escalated from that point. The car that Vincent Tabak had said Chris Jeffries must have driven the night that Joe went missing was painstakingly searched for forensic evidence. It was so intense as to be quite numbing. Jeffries had said that he'd stayed in reading that night. Had he lied? All the possessions that I had with me were taken away. His prized possessions, his books, were taken by police. I remember saying, what evidence do you have? Friends organised legal support as he underwent three days of questioning and spent nights in a cell. His way of life was snatched from him. I might have begun emotionally to, to break down. The conditions of being held in a police station are extremely stressful. But Christopher Jeffries was an innocent man. He was released without charge, so Joe's killer was still at large. Towards the end of the questioning, um, when it became clear that the police were not going to be able to find any ev evidence at all to charge me, then I did start to think, well, a lot of time has been wasted on an innocent person. Uh, whoever was responsible for Joe's disappearance and murder is still on the loose and remains a danger to the public. The public in Holland was only vaguely aware of the story. Bristol police knew that the man who offered damning but false evidence against Chris Jeffries had been alone in Canning Road the night that Joe disappeared. So I sent a team to investigate us out to the Netherlands to speak to him and his girlfriend as a witness to capture that information because I felt that was crucial to my investigation. At that meeting, one thing the police officers asked for was a voluntary DNA sample from Vincent Tabak. He was somewhat reluctant to do so, um, sufficiently reluctant for the officer who took the sample actually to phone the incident room in Bristol and report that reluctance as being something that concerned her. It wasn't quite right. Vincent Tabak was now very much a person of interest to the police. It wasn't until the officers returned from the Netherlands and they spoke to Vincent Tabak on New Year's Eve that Karen Thomas, uh, the officer that spoke to Vincent Tabak and took the statement from him, raised some concerns those concerns related to Tabak's movements on the evening of December 17th, but more evidence was emerging. The police, having had his DNA sample obtained voluntarily in Holland and checked against um, findings on Joe's body, discovered that his DNA was on her body. And that was one of the key factors that led to the planned arrest of him in later January. There was one man in England who thought the likeable Vincent Tabak could not possibly be guilty, his landlord. When Vincent was arrested, I was very surprised indeed because he certainly didn't strike me as somebody who um, I would suspect and I had some concern for him because I was worried that perhaps the police had made another mistake and somebody else had been unjustly um, taken into custody. 
um, and I could imagine the same thing happening to him um, 